Good, good morning, Ian. Uh, Bobby Sharma with Higher uh, Profits podcast number five. I'm, I'm thrilled to have Ian Iapolito Iep, on the on the podcast today. I actually I'm a subscriber to one of his newsletters, uh, and it talks. Uh, it's focused on crowdfunding, and I get that newsletter at least uh, once a month, and I read it. Uh, I'm invested in crowdfunding. Uh, this is a, a uh, an area that's near and dear to me. Uh, so um, I was really uh, honored when uh, when Ian I reached out to Ian through the website, and he uh, he agreed to be on the podcast. He responded right away. So Ian, uh, thank you, sir, for for joining us from Tampa, Florida, and um, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about you know your your. I, I'll just add that you, you, there was a technology startup that you were you had uh, in in your previous lives, and I was actually uh, I was using that website called Rentacoder. So t- tell us about <laughs> the beginnings. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's great to be here, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, yeah. So my previous beginnings. Well, as you said, I actually I'm a tech entrepreneur. So I had this website called Rentacoder, which I which, as you know, but your listeners don't, is basically a place where you could hire a programmer. And back then, you know, now it's like, okay, you hire over the internet, but back then you couldn't. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, you know, it was this, this whole process of being able to hire someone who didn't live right next to you and you could save a lot of money. They could make money where they couldn't. So I was a tech entrepreneur for many years, um, ran several different companies. Um, that one was kind of like my big last one because so it was Rent-A-Coder, and then it became VWorker after a while, kind of expanded into like doing writing and other things like that. And then I was fortunate enough where I sold it. So I sold it to a company in Australia called freelancer.com. Yep. And uh, yep, they were looking to get into the US market. Okay. So, uh, you know, I sold it. And then all of a sudden now it was weird. You know, I've been working all my life to that point. Now I had the huge exit and now my job was to manage my own money. And so, you know, how do I do that? And I wasn't really happy with the traditional advice, which is like take X percent and put it in stocks, X percent and put it in bonds, and you're done. Um, You know, uh, my wife also makes, we make our decisions jointly. And, you know, she had had previous ups and downs in the stock market too. So, you know, we were concerned about the volatility, wanted to do more. So um, right at that time was right when real estate crowdfunding was just coming out. This was like around 2013 or so. And there were, so the law had just relatively recently been put out and there were a lot of platforms. There were like a hundred different platforms at the time. And so I was like, well, this is really interesting. I'd like to learn about this, but there was nothing about it. So it was so new. So what I did was I basically paid a researcher and myself together and we went and we interviewed. Well, first of all, we went to all the platforms and we got their information and we found investors and we interviewed them. And I talked to the principals and I looked at the legal documents and I, and I went through all these things, figuring out where am I going to put my money, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so I did that. And, um, you know, so I came up with this list and I was like, these are the ones I like. These are the ones I'm not so certain about. And um, the word kind of got out. Hey, Ian has done all this due diligence. You don't need to do it yourself. Just ask him for it. Yeah. And so I got tired of emailing that list to everybody over and over again. And so I said, you know what, I'm just going to put it up on an internet site and then that way you can get it. And so that was basically this, this site that became the real estate crowdfunding review, which as you know, so it's great that you are uh, a subscriber. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Ian, so, yeah, yeah, Ian, that's the exact, uh, when the, when the uh, jobs act passed and, you know, I was a private money lender and I, I also thought, you know, look, uh, crowdfunding seems amazing. Like this is, this is where I could quickly, easily, uh, in, in a, you know, park my money, invest my money. Uh, but tell us a little bit about what did you uncover that, that you know, uh, that most people don't know uh, about crowdfunding platforms uh, that were, there were so many and now it's, they've shrunk down to like five or six, like you said, five or six good ones. But what caused, you know, so many of them to collapse? Well, I, yeah, I, I do feel that there's about five or six good ones now. And uh, to be fair, I mean, there are a lot more than that still. I mean, there's probably about, you know, 30 or 40, but that's a lot less than there was. And, 
I feel th there, there were problems, I mean, with a lot of those early sites. Um, a lot of them didn't have, I mean, they, they had problems coming with the way they ran, and then they had problems with the way they handled things when things go wrong. Um, just in the way they ran, um, you know, well, maybe I'll start with the way, when things go wrong. That's the easy one, because that's what happened with some of them. <laughs> so, so, so basically, a lot of these sites didn't have very good bankruptcy protection. So in other words, if something goes wrong, what happens? Like I have this investment, this company's running the investment, they're the administrator, they go bankrupt, what happens? What happens to my money? Um, and you know, we recently ran into that with one of the platforms with iFunding, and uh, you mentioned another one that you, know, that you were into, which went through the exact same thing. So um, you know, that was a really important thing. And I noticed that a few of them had protections put in place, but most of them didn't. So that made me really nervous right at the beginning. Um, I noticed that some of them would kind of put skin in the game of some point, you know, of some sort of money. Either they're putting in money to kind of like put the, make the deal happen and they fund it first, you know, they pre-fund it, or maybe they put real skin in the game. Maybe they actually co-invest. Again, a very small number. Most of them, nothing like that. So they had no skin in the game. So, you know, there were problems like that. And then what happened is, so at the beginning of the industry, people were just throwing money at it left and right. They were just like, wow, this is like the best thing in the whole world. VCs were in there throwing money at everyone. All the companies, it was very easy to, to get funding. So what happened is, that was like for about two years. Mm -hmm. Then what happened is, um, I don't know if you remember, but Lending Club, I don't know if you're familiar with Lending Club yeah. at all. Yeah. Okay. They're in San Francisco. I, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, you know, had many loans through Lending Club and was a big fan of them for a long time. But what happened is, uh, and I'm not investing in them anymore now, though. I haven't been happy with what's happened with the returns. But, um, you know, Lending Club was the first big winner in fintech. They went, you know, they went public and they were valued at a couple billion dollars. Everyone made a whole bunch of money. But then it came out that they had kind of done some things that, you know, uh, as far as maybe putting out some numbers at the beginning about certain loans that maybe didn't really quite happen. That kind of got them their big push and put them in the right place. So anyway, there was a scandal, an accounting scandal. Yeah. And, uh, the, and that, so that messed up lending club and that messed up all of FinTech, which is what these fall under financial tech, because now everyone was like, Whoa, if the biggest, most respected, well-known company in this area is going to do that, what's, you know, what are these other little guys going to do? So funding dried up a lot of these companies had staffed way up and then they had to fire a whole bunch of people and they're just barely trying to keep the lights on and trying to find some way to stay afloat. And uh, a lot of them tried to keep it quiet. They didn't want people to know about it. But so I, you know, not only do I have the real estate investing uh, public website, but I have a private investor club where we can kind of talk about things in private. And so we, we noticed some, some signs, you know, of things like, hmm, you know, things don't quite look right. And you know, a lot of people were under NDAs. They couldn't talk about being fired, but indirectly they could say things. So anyway, a bunch of layoffs and people having pro trouble keeping afloat. So that, that went on for a couple of years. And as a result, some of them went under. Then there's kind of like the new phase that we're in right now. So the VCs that funded the first part are not willing to put in more money, right? To some of these, they thought, oh, it's going to be like an easy thing. I'll double my money in a short period of time. Now, even the successful ones, it's not going to be like this kind of growth. It's going to be like maybe like this kind of growth. So the VCs aren't willing to put in more money. So uh, in general, one or two have been able to do it, but in general, no. So now these platforms are basically going to their own investors and saying, hey, can you help to keep us running? And so you see that on several of the platforms right now. So that's kind of like the phase that, you know, that we are in. So I myself... While I, I do grab things from the platform, I'm always looking. I, I look at 100 deals a month, more than 100 probably. So wow. I look at everything that's coming in. But I find that at this stage of the cycle, I, I'm very conservative. So I, I want the most experienced sponsors. I want sponsors that have done it before, been through a recession, didn't lose any money, be really good. And there are a few. I, I'm, I'm not finding them on the crowdfunding platforms anymore. These are the type of, of sponsors that have such a loyal investor base they don't they don't need to be on these so the ones that you find on the platforms tend to be the less experienced ones and uh and i think it's good for a certain type of investor and a certain portion of any investor's portfolio but the the 
the really, really experienced sponsors are just, uh, they're not out there, not at this stage of the cycle anyway. I agree. I agree. They, uh, so my personal experience was that not only was there some uh, level of incompetency or inexperience at the management level of these platforms, but also some of the, uh, the sponsors, the operators that were bringing their deals um, were of the, the, the lower quality, the lower caliber. Uh, they didn't really have a huge track record. Uh, you know, some of them had been doing fix and flips for a little while and, and they thought you know, the crowdfunding was the easy way to go raise capital. Uh, so in, in my case, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I did three deals, uh, two on uh, realty shares and one on patch of land. One on realty shares uh, is, is in trouble and the patch of land is, in all, in, is also in trouble. And now I can't even get an update from the folks at patch of land. But, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but it's, you know, it, it, it was a, it was a debt. Uh, they were both debt deals. So I'm, I'm hoping that one, one gentleman in uh, actually uh, it's in Southern Florida. Um, he's, basically declared bankruptcy and so it's now tied up in for uh, yeah, over that's, uh, yeah three years now uh, uh, ooh, yeah. Ooh. yeah and it's in florida so it's going to take a while but yes yes and and i don't know if your listeners and some of them are probably aware but some may not be of the difference between a judicial state and a non-judicial state really important when doing those hard money loans if something goes wrong in that non-judicial state great it's a non-judicial process. You don't have to go through an attorney. It might take a couple months. Just do your foreclosure, get it done with, and you're finished relatively cheap. Okay. In the judicial-only states, you got to go to court. They can fight it. They can drag it out for years if they want to. It's expensive, and you can just – it eats away at your equity cushion, and, so, and you, can easily, you can easily get a loss. Yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah. No, and, 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 and for my viewers, uh, Ian, that's a very good point. Like, people should really be – uh, aware of what if they're investing outside of their area or they're investing in uh, non uh, in, in judicial states uh, as lenders, uh, you know, be, be aware, be be careful, read up on it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, th th that's a very good point. Uh, so, 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 where are you at now, Ian? You've got the private group, you've got the review site. Are you and you're have you, but you, you said mainly you're focused now on working with high quality sponsors that have a, a long track record. They'll stand behind their offering They'll and, and their conservative operators. Uh, how has, where, so where do you see this kind of evolving? Uh, you know, how are investors going to invest in the next 10 years? Um, you know, as, as far as like uh, using technology to invest, how do you see that evolving? Yeah, it's interesting because I assumed that it was going to be at the beginning, these crowdfunding sites would facilitate it, right? Okay. So, um, and I think they have their place. And I think once the cycle resets, we have a recession and, you know, and we're coming back out of it again. That's the time when these more aggressive, younger sponsors, they have a lot more runway to work with. And, you know, it'll be a lot easier for them. Uh, I'm just concerned about what happens if we hit a recession, you know, and just like you know, what happens. So, um, so, so personally, what I can tell you is like, yeah, so I've kind of migrated from, I still look at the deals and occasionally I will find one out there, but I'm very, very strict about my due diligence process. So uh, most of the time they're coming from personal networking. So the club, basically, there's 3000 people in the club. It's a good network. So, yeah. So it's like, Hey, when I find a new deal, I bring it in. When someone else finds a new sponsor, they bring it in. And then together we kind of hammer on it and we, we look for flaws. And if it survives that process, then they're a pretty good sponsor. So, uh, so that is working really good for me right now for the bulk of my, you know, investing. As far yeah. as the future, you know, I, I do think that there's going to be a shakeout in the crowdfunding industry. I think that we'll have a recession. If it's a severe one, I hope you know, no one wants a severe recession. But if it happens, I think there's going to be a shakeout. There may be only two or three left at the end, you know. But uh, if it's a mild recession, I think maybe, you know, we'll, we'll probably be about the way we are now. Yeah. I think in the next upturn, you know, there will be more people jumping into this. And, 
And for people who are not as maybe going as deeply into the due diligence, it'll be a safer time to kind of do it sure. than it is now. Um, so that, that's kind of where I see it. But the concept of the crowdfunding is a great one, I think, which is basically the idea of taking an investment, splitting up into little pieces. Now I can diversify where before I had to buy a big property. Now I can buy just a little piece and I can diversify my property across geography, across asset types, across strategy. It's a fantastic thing. Yes. But, um, you know, I, so I think that will definitely survive. It just, uh, there's gonna be some changes, I think. Got it, got it. No, I, 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 I totally agree with you. It, it will, it, it, the concept was amazing and that's why I, I, I said, you know what, it, it, I, I should take a stab at this. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, hopefully, um, you know, it'll, some of these deals will pan, uh, pan themselves out. But, uh, um, uh, but as far as like, uh, you know, what, on the sponsor, what information is available publicly versus like if, if you know, because people change their LLC names, they change their websites, they change the, uh, the management teams, how do you, how do you go about uh, doing your due diligence and your underwriting on the, the deals that you're looking at as far as the sponsors are concerned? What are, what are some of the top three or four things that you look at? Well, uh, it's scary, but I probably have a list of about 100 things I look at. <laughs> um, and actually, you know, if, if your listeners are interested, I make that available on the public internet. I have like, it's like a five step, five part article. It's big, yeah. but if they're interested, it's like, it's big, but yeah. So I, um, and everyone has their own unique way of doing due diligence, yeah. but the way that works for me, I start with the sponsor first and then I look at the deal. Some people will go the opposite way. They look at the deal first, they go, Oh, this is great. And then they look at the sponsor to me, a, a bad sponsor can take an awesome looking deal and mess it up. And a, you know, a good quality sponsor can get into a tough situation and find out a way to turn it around. So that's why for me, I start with the sponsor. But to answer your question, you're like, well, how do you do due diligence? These people are, some of these are kind of fly by net companies and they'll reorganize and stuff like that. You know, so, you know, maybe it's a little bit flippant or whatever, but if I see that, like if I see, oh, they've only been around for a couple of years, at least in this dark incarnation, I'm already done. It's a very quick no. So um, there, there's, there's hundreds to choose from. Like if there were only a few, sure. then maybe I would find some way to like dig in further and stuff. But I'm like, well, you know what? Why should I bother on this guy here when I've got, you know, this one here that's survived a full real estate cycle, didn't lose money, has a track record, you know, all that sort of stuff. Sure. So, um, so I'm very strict on experience. So if I don't see that there and they've reorganized or they've done whatever, you know, they're, they're out. I want to see them put skin in the game too. I, I don't want, you know, them to like feel no negative consequences if, if the things go wrong. Um, that's not, people will say, oh, well, you know, a lot of times these deals are structured where maybe the sponsor only makes money when they do well. Like maybe they're, they're structured with a, with a promote or waterfall structure, uh, which is great. But actually what that does is it actually incentivizes the sponsor to push the risk envelope and get the performance up as high as possible. That's, not, that's what I don't want. Yep. So kind of like offsetting that, I want skin in the game. So I look for skin in the game. I look for that they've structured their debt conservatively. So um, for example, like on a hard money loan, I won't go over 65% loan to value. I want a good cushion in there in case something goes wrong. Um, I wanna see if it's an equity thing, I wanna see like long-term debt because if it's short-term, they have to, the way your listeners may not realize, but the way commercial real estate works is it's a balloon payment. So when the, the, the loan is over, you have to pay the whole thing back if you can't refinance. So, um, so I want to see that it's a nice long term so that that way, if there is a, a crisis or something, they have, they have time to, to work it out. I like to see that it's a fixed rate debt actually, rather than floating. Floating is cheaper, but uh, if, if I'm concerned about the long term, I would rather eliminate the whole interest rate risk thing. Sure. Um, so, so like there's a bunch of things that I look at. I, I look at the fee structure. Some people say, oh, well, it doesn't matter the fee structure. If you like them, you like them. If you don't, you don't. Well, yeah, but the fee structure tells me stuff. Um, if something is, I'll pay a little bit more for someone that I like a lot, but if it's like way out of line, to me, that's someone that's marketing to kind of an unsophisticated investor. They don't, they don't 
either, you know, either they don't know what's the yeah. going rate, which is bad, or they do, but they're targeting an audience that doesn't know. Yeah. Uh, either one of those is bad. So I, I look at the fee structure and I compare it to the averages and I say, does this sponsor look reasonable or not? Um, so yeah. things like that. And then I'll take a look at the strategy and things like that. I'll kind of go into the deal itself. Makes a lot of sense. Uh... And, and Ian, tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, you know, number one, I know you do a lot of charity work. So tell us a little bit about your charity and then also, you know, how, how can people find you on, uh, on the Internet? Like, what's the best way for them to get hold of you? Oh, great. Well, uh, there's an organization here. So I live in Tampa and there's an organization here which has a local branch, but I think they are all over the U.S. It's called Feeding America. The one here is called Feeding America Tampa. And it's really kind of crazy. You know, we live in a very prosperous country, but you would not believe how many people, including little kids who do not have, like they don't have enough money for lunch, for example. So little kids who, you know, so this is a fantastic program where uh, you can volunteer to actually like, that's, that's what we've done. So we've gone to like some of the schools and, and handed out these lunches that, and, and you, you donate money and that goes to buying food and stuff like that. So it's a, a fantastic uh, charity. So I, I, I love it. Um, for people who are looking to contact me, please, you know, head over to the real estate crowdfunding review. So we've got the public website there. There's a contact form. You can sign up for the newsletter, which I'm glad you're loving. And then the second thing is right there. Also, if you're interested, you can sign up for the private investor club. And that's where we do all the due diligence on the deals and we hammer on them to really make sure that they're good. Um, you know, and we're welcome. I, I should just add that for the, the club, the one rule is that someone that's a sponsor can't be in it because, you know, it kind of ruins it if yeah. someone yeah. is talking, you know, ba talking smack about a competitor or, you know, so, so that is the one thing. But other than that, you know, uh, we welcome everyone. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, uh, th thank you so much, Ian. And I know um, you have family in the Bay Area. So if you're ever in the Bay Area and I'd love to have you come and speak to our audience because I know per personally, I know, that you have a wealth of knowledge and I'm, I just admire how detailed you are in your analysis. And I think a lot of my, my members could learn from be, being as thorough as, as, as uh, you know, with, you know, in their analysis. So um, uh, maybe sometime in 2020, if you happen to be out here, uh, you know, uh, uh, please let me know and we'll, we'll get you on our, on our, uh, in, in our meetups. That sounds great. Yeah. Maybe we could do something on like due diligence or something like that. Would love to. That'd be a lot of fun. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Ian. You're welcome, Bobby. All right. All right. Great.